I'm in the Philippines here. I hope you're all well. We're going to do a piece today about Southeast Asia and autogynophilia in it. Now, when I first started coming to Southeast Asia seven years ago, I believe, like most people in the West, that autogynophilia was rare here. Uh, it's not. And so when I discovered that it wasn't, I had to start thinking about why people had come to this misapprehension. Um, the first thing to note is that the, the, the assumption that it was very rare seems to have come from uh, studies done mainly by, mainly from studies done by um, Sam Winter, Dr. Sam Winter at the University then, the University of Hong Kong. And so, you know, I pulled the studies and I read them, and the methodology was appalling. Uh, basically, the, the researchers had simply gone around the streets and, you know, I don't like to cut it too short here, but that's what I'm going to do, and basically asked trans women they met in the street if they were attracted to men. Now, a couple of things to say. First of all, Blanchard himself predicted that amongst street prostitutes, you would find a far greater percentage of HSTS and a reduced percent percentage of AGPs. There was no control for that. Secondly, also a major foopy, the people that they were interviewing were almost certainly prostitutes. These are people trying to sell sex to men. Do you seriously expect them to turn around and say, well, no, I'm not attracted to men? It's axiomatic that if you ask a prostitute something and she thinks you can sell you sex, she'll say whatever you, she thinks you want to hear. No controls. So these were the two big problems with the existing surveys. Now, let's look at the nature of the culture, the, the culture in Southeast Asia. And we'll talk about, about it from the Philippines angle. In Luzon in the Philippines, Luzon's the northern island of the Philippines, the word for a feminized male is bakla. Right? There's loads of others, Becky's. Badings, there's um, other words used in Thailand, or Katoi, Indonesia, or Waria. There's loads of different names around the region, but they all mean exactly the same thing. That is a feminized male. Now, how can you get to be a feminized male and therefore a bachelor? Well, one way is you're attracted to men. If you're a boy who likes men, who likes the idea of sex with men, you're automatically a bachelor. And if you're a bachelor, you will be expected to look like one, that is to appear to be feminine, to feminize your appearance, right? So you'll become what is called in the West a ladyboy. But there's another way you can get there. Supposing you're a boy who really likes to dress up as a woman and to perform as a woman, right? Well, you're a bachelor too. No way around that one. You're also a bachelor. And if you're a bachelor, in that case, you'll be expected to get yourself a boyfriend. Because that's what bachelors do, they get boyfriends. So that will stimulate a thing that is called in Blanchard theory pseudo-bisexualism. Other people use different names for it, but really that's the simplest one. And that is the condition where an individual who has autogynophilia will pursue sex with men while in role, while dressed as a woman. So again you have this issue where people who are battlers will assume that they should be pseudo-bisexual, right? Even if they're... they're uh, autogynophilic. And you can tell the difference. The difference is actually quite easy to tell if you can interview the people. Because again, and this follows Blanchard, HSDS will have started to have their feelings. And remember, this will be, have been remarked and can be confirmed by those around them at the time. That's their parents, their sisters. They'll have been, you know, towels on their heads and running around like girls since they were five or six years old. Maybe seven, maybe eight. For the autogynophilic population, it tends to come up on in what they call the sophomore year, which is when they're 15. So one is appearing prior to puberty, classic HSTS, and the other is appearing after puberty, classic AGP. And there's plenty of both. So we'll come on into onto where we can find these autogynophiles in just a moment. But first, I want to look again at the different types of autogynophilia. Now, We've already discussed four types, and for a long time I thought there were only four types. And these were transvestic, uh, anatomical, physiological, and behavioral. Um, I've explained these elsewhere, I don't need to go into that just now. Lawrence and Bailey proposed a fifth type, which they called interpersonal. And for a long time I thought, well, you know, that's not really going to work, because that's, that's really covered, you know, in behavioral, uh, particularly, autogynophilia and also in terms of pseudo-bisexualism. This 
new category, this fifth category of autogynephilia, interpersonal autogynephilia, is where the reward is in being appreciated as a woman, admired as a woman, um, accepted as a woman by others. So what's being looked for here is the specific response of other people to your presentation as a woman. And as I say, I thought these were, that was redundant. I thought, you know, you're going to cover that with behavioural. But here in the Philippines, and this is true across the region, something happened, happens which really doesn't seem to happen in the West. And that is, there are huge numbers, huge numbers of, we'll call them bakla, we'll use the Philippine word, bakla pageants, bakla comedy bars, bakla cabarets, bakla shows, you name it, performance venues that feature only baklas. And nearly all the baklas in these will be autogynephilic. So what seems to be happening is that there's this kind of, what I was going to call performance autogynephilia. But I'm not in the business of adding new terms when a good one exists. And if we expand interpersonal autogynephilia to include this idea of performance, then you've basically answered a great deal of the questions about autogynephilia in Southeast Asia. If you want to find large numbers of autogynephiles in Southeast Asia, you don't go around the streets. You go to the comedy bars, you go to the cabarets, you go to the beauty pageants, you go to the big shows, because that's where they're all going to be, right? There's a whole bunch of them working in things like uh, salons and, and stuff like that, but the really exceptional ones, the ones that are going to be obvious, they're going to be working in these, they're going to be found either performing in or performing the, the supporting roles in the cabarets and the pageants. Now I think when we, when we see autogynephilia as having this very large performance aspect, which it does, remember these are people performing the role of women and being applauded for it, getting paid for it. Um, I, I don't suppose many of you have ever been inside uh, the dressing room of a show like this. They don't usually let you take pictures, but I have. And it's, you know, it's an autogynephile's wet dream. It's unbelievable. I mean, there's more chiffon and frillies and silk and boas than you could possibly imagine. It's outrageous. And, you know, there's like half a dozen or a dozen uh, trans women there all putting on their makeup and getting all ready. I mean, it's the same, and you find the same in something like the Follies Berger, of course. But here, the common ones are the trans ones. So this is, this, you can see how this, this really attracts autogynophiles because they get to play this role. And not only that, they get to play it with and uh, off each other. You know, so it's really big and rewarding for them. So with that revelation in mind, it should be clear now that there's a lot more autogynophiles than were either too suspected because people like Simon and they never bothered going to the pageants, they never bothered going to the shows, they didn't go to the comedy bars, they just wandered around the streets. And that's the wrong place to find them. Now, there's another issue here, um, and this is less the case in the Philippines than it is in Thailand. But in Thailand, baklas are called katoi in Thailand, as I'm sure most of you would know. In Thailand, street prostitution is performance art, okay? Uh, you walk down the street, the famous street in Pattaya, Walking Street, Bangla Road in, in Phuket, these areas, and you'll see lots of very tall, very striking trans women performing. They're performing as women. This is performance also again, philia. They're also selling themselves as uh, you know, as courtesans. So they do also have uh, pseudo bisexualism, but actually this is this is provided for in the definition of interpersonal uh, autogynephilia, because one factor in it is enjoying sex with men when in role. Now you have to understand these girls are never out of role, they're in role all the time. They live as women. So absolutely, they're going to offer themselves to men, and if you ask them, are you attracted to men, they'll say yes. Right? It doesn't mean they're not autogynephilic. They are. You know, big bars, big popular bars like Country Bar and Walking Street, and the, you know, you go to Obsessions or any of these ones in uh, 
none applies to them. They're absolutely full of obvious autogyna files. And they're so full of autogyna files that you hardly see the HSTS because they're all small and dainty and petite and not very forward. You know, whereas the, the, the autogyna files will be right in your face trying to sell their, their wares. So this should tell you that autogynephilia is widespread. It's wor it is actually worldwide. But it should encourage us, I think, to look at autogynephilia slightly differently. Ray Blanchard, when he first conceived of autogynephilia, always conceived it as a fetish, you know, a pathological fetish. And a lot of us wonder, well, how did that happen? If we see it perhaps as being a delight in playing the role of a woman to the point that this becomes a sexualized reward, then I think we've answered an awful lot of questions. You know, all of the people that we can think of, all the great thespians who just love to play female roles, people like Alistair Sim, for example, were probably interpersonally autogynephilic. Now that doesn't mean that they were indulging in any of the other forms, because autogynephilia is a very broad church, and it has many, many different forms. I'm going to disagree with um, a number of people in their, and I used to think the same way, you know, I used to think that the ETLE was really the, the, the defining parameter for autogynephilia, but actually I'm beginning to think that maybe the performance aspect is more important and that therefore interpersonal autogynephilia, which should be seen as kind of like the first one to look at, you know, um, and that maybe the other forms kind of grow out of that. That if you have, you know, it, people in the West particularly live in extremely repressive cultures, because Anglo the Anglo-Saxon West, that is. The Anglo-Saxon West is notoriously transphobic. You're just not allowed to be trans. There's a horror, an absolute horror of men feminizing themselves, or males feminizing themselves, which simply doesn't exist in Southeast Asia. Here it's okay, you know. If you want to be a feminine male, that's not going to be a problem for you. There might be some jobs that uh, you can't do, but that's because of the influence of, unfortunately, Anglo-Saxon culture. In general terms, there's no real, it's not like a big stigma, it's not a big deal. If you want to walk down the street wearing a dress or what, you know, I went to see a rock band not that long ago, they were all wearing pink floral dresses and, you know, big training shoes and socks and hairy legs, and it was just funny. And everybody thought this was a hoot, you know. It's just not, it's just not the kind of big deal that it would be, especially in US, you know, the, the American society, US society is unbelievably conformist, far more than even most UK citizens would understand, far more so than even US citizens understand. They don't realize just how rigid and conformist a society they live in. You know, there's whole bunches of things you're not allowed to do. People actually fall out with each other over politics in the United States. Like, what? Leaving that aside. When you live in a culture like this, where it, it's not really a big deal, you know, um, if you're a male who likes to dress as a woman, nobody's going to, you're not going to get, get beaten up for this. It's not going to be a problem for you. You're going to be able to go to the shops, you're going to do what you want. Like I say, there might be some jobs that they can say, hey, guy, steady on, right? Uh, especially if you're only doing it occasionally. But if you, if you live full time as a woman, then there's probably not going to be any issues at all. We've got women, trans women doing all sorts of jobs now here, all over the place. So I begin to wonder if many of the uh, aspects of autogynephilia that uh, were so concerning and so troubling, or, or remain so, in the uh, Anglophone West are not to do with repression rather than the actual autogynephilia itself. And it, makes me ask if a, a reasonable approach to, to therapy for AGP might not just be to indulge it. You know, set up a theatre group, put on a review, set up pageants, do some do things where you can get that reward, you can go on and, and be like absolutely glamorous, you know, do the Danny LaRue thing and be like, wow, isn't that beautiful, isn't that gorgeous, and get the applause, you know, especially if you're capable of being funny which I have to say a lot of AGPs aren't really good at in the West, but in Southeast Asia, they're outrageously funny. Uh, the, the, one of the funniest people on here, on television here, is Vice Ganda, who's a very obviously autogynephilic butler. 
an incredibly talented and smart person, and who is also extremely funny. You know, she's uh, she's just a total laugh a minute, and and and, and it's all. It's a, I think the difference is that when people are, like are allowed to express themselves in this way, you know, without feeling they have to hide themselves, that a lot of the the pressure towards perhaps darker behaviours just goes away. You know, repression is never a good thing. Never. It doesn't matter what the problem is. It's better to get it out and confront it rather than to repress it. And autonomia is basically harmless. You know, it doesn't do any damage. It can cause like consequential problems if it's not understood or dealt with properly. But the condition itself is completely harmless. I mean, so what if you like to dress up as a woman? You know, it, it, it's a it's a complete so what. And people should accept that. You know, if you want to have sex as a woman, if you want to perform as a woman, so what? Big deal. It's a nothing. It's a non-starter. And so I think that, from the point of view of people who are struggling with autogynophilia, I think the first thing I would do, you know, I'm lucky I don't, but if I did, then I think the first thing that would be a starting point would be to try to develop some sort of way that I could express the... Uh, I could get that validation, because validation is the whole thing with autogynophilia, that's the biggest part of it, uh, is that validation as a woman, of being female, you know, validating, I want, I'm a woman. And so people who would say, you know, oh, you look wonderful tonight, or your dress is fantastic, did you make that yourself? You know, and all that sort of stuff. Now, autogynophiles do this. You know, we know that they have knitting parties, and sometimes he's done sex parties, but that's not the point. The point is that there's validation going on. And I think that from the point of view of the uh, the autogynophile, the first thing to say is don't suffer alone. Uh, autogynophilia is, especially when we take into account this, this idea of interpersonal autogynophilia, it's a social thing. Right? There's almost no point in being autogynophilic on your own, you know, in your bedroom in front of a mirror. I mean, you're basically, okay, you're the you're the star in your own porn movie, Yahoo! But really, it's, it's going to be a lot easier to deal with if you can share it, if you can do it with other people, and if you can put on a review. I mean, especially young people, you know, young people love to perform. Uh, they're at an age when they have tremendous confidence in there, or they can have tremendous confidence. And of course, actually performing breeds confidence. So, why not? Why not put on comedy reviews? Why not put on shows, pageants, why not? I mean, the feminists don't like pageants, but who cares what they think? Uh, just seize the day. Say, okay, fine, I'm just going to do this. And I think if you do, I think, I think that the pressure for some of the more unnecessary transition issues, like GRS, will really radically shrink. It just will go away. I mean, remember, what you're trying to do is get validation. That's the whole point of interpersonal AGP, that's the whole point of um, the idea of other people accepting you for what you're projecting as. And if you can do that, if you can make that your talisman, if you like, if you can make that the centre of your life, then I think that you're going to find that it's a lot easier to deal with. And I think that if you ask thespians, actors, you know, who, who do this, I think you'll find that they they really enjoy the, the, the gives them relief, you know. I mean, they probably don't understand how to get into the air, but they do understand that, that that idea of playing a woman and, and getting the reward for it is is something they enjoy, they, 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 and it takes the pressure off, you know. They're not going to rush out and get themselves GRS or you know break up their wives and ruin their homes if one night a week or two nights a week they can star in the local review. I mean, that's it. And, you, you know, everybody thinks it's fun. So, I'm not trying to, to belittle the, uh, the seriousness of, of autogynophilia at all. But what I'm saying is that what I've seen in, the, the, in Southeast Asia and the way that autogynophiles integrate into society through this idea of performance, and when we look and we see that, yes, well, this is actually a recognized form of autogynophilia through interpersonal autogynophilia, then I think we could maybe look at things just a little bit differently, and maybe a little bit more helpfully, I think. Well, anyway, I hope that's helped. It's my thoughts on this, but I'm sure I'll be doing more on this.
but we'll see you later.